Welcome to Graceful Aging. I'm your host, Gregory Bader, with Juan Harris from the Hanley Center in Florida, who is a substance abuse um, program director. Thanks for being with Graceful Aging. Thank you, Greg, and thanks for having me on today. Oh, my pleasure. Yeah. You know, is, is the issue, you know, we, we grew up um, mm -hmm. with the 60s and the 70s, and everybody knew from the cover of mm -hmm. Time magazine almost of the use of psychedelic drugs and how that was pervading a culture. Mm -hmm. Are we seeing a resurgence of it or has it ever left? I think the answer to that, Greg, is twofold. Um, that was a time when the, the mantra for the era was tune in, turn on, and drop out. And for those that were raised in that time frame, uh, as they are aged and they become 50 years old and some 60 years old, uh, that thinking has come forward with them. And what we are seeing now is a reemergence of, of illicit drug use in that population. And how, how prevalent of a problem are you seeing it? Is it, is it growing? Is it? Oh, it's, in, it's increasing. And now the drugs are changing, but the rate of use uh, is increasing. The trends are illicit drug use in the, in the boomer and the older adult population. Um, is increasing more than than 300 percent wow. um, over a 10-year period. So mm -hmm. it's a it's a very alarming trend that we need to be aware of when we think about how many Americans, uh, the silver tsunami I call it, are, are actually aging into uh, this age group. Mm -hmm. And when you say illicit drugs, what are we talking about? We're talking cocaine. Mm -hmm. We're talking marijuana. We're talking heroin. Uh, we're talking methamphetamine. We're talking drugs that are not FDA approved drugs. Mm -hmm. And um, the use of these drugs by older Americans is, is increasing at, at an alarming rate. You know, I've read some really disturbing things in terms of, uh, and it's shocking almost, that mm -hmm. in suburban communities around mm -hmm. large cities, mm -hmm. that there's a growing heroin use by middle class men and women. Um, mm -hmm. And, and they're, they're turning to those types of substances. Mean, I don't, I'm not sure why. Is it maybe cheaper than some of the other forms for them? Well, that is true. That trend is true. And more than that, the social implications that that's having. Say, for instance, uh, the 18-year-old the inner city kid. Right. Uh, that's doing some robbery with a nine millimeter or some other fancy handgun. Well, the, the parents of those inner city kids don't own those guns. Those guns are being brought in from the kids from the suburbia who've either stolen them from their families and brought them in to trade for drugs, or sometimes, of course, the guns are obtained through burglaries and all. Uh, but all of this is secondary to the drug culture. Mm -hmm. But yes, there's an alarming trend in suburbia. It used to be more of an inner city problem, but it has moved to the suburbs. And um, not only suburbs in, um, in metropolitan areas, but even rural areas mm -hmm. as well. We would probably spend a full show talking about the effects that, it, that drug addiction reaches out and touches. Mm -hmm. But let's, let's draw it in a little bit and, and for a, a family or for a, a mm -hmm. friend. How does someone, how do you raise the issue if you mm -hmm. suspect or believe that there's a problem going on? How, how would I do that? How would, how would you recommend? When speaking with an older adult or an older or boomer mm -hmm. about a drug or an alcohol issue, it's very important to understand from the beginning that denial that, there, that a problem even exists is a common part of this illness. So with that in mind it's important to to approach the subject in a way that somehow connects the drug problem or the alcohol use to some other issue that's happening in the person's life for instance what for example i may say to a mother a, a daughter may say to a mother uh, that she's concerned about her drinking and instead of saying mom i think you're drinking too much with with which would strengthen her resistance to the idea, she may say something, well, you know, Mom, I'm wondering if you're not responding to your diabetes medication or your hypertensive medication uh, the way that you once did, and, and why do you believe that is? And, and sort of encourage her to explore reasons and, um, 
and in doing that with encouragement, they may bring up the drinking themselves, and then that's an opportunity to say, well, would you like to talk to someone about that? Or would you be willing to talk to someone, see what it could be? And that takes the family member who are closest to the problem mm -hmm. uh, away from being the confrontive individual, which sort of solidifies the split. So. You know, it's so easy, though, when mm -hmm. you're frustrated yourself yeah. and you look at the, the problems that a yeah. person's having, most people still, like, try to hit somebody over the head with a hammer. Yeah. Just want to jump right in there and take over and, and they want to fix them. Just tell them what to do. Yeah. Uh, uh, and that, that doesn't work. Does it, it doesn't work. And um, one of the big mistakes that I see people uh, make is they want to take the bottle and, and just take the bottle and pour it out. Mm -hmm. Well, empty all the empty, empty all the booze out of the house and just pour it out. Well, the problem with that, while withdrawal, which is the physiological effect mm -hmm. that a person has when they when the physical sure. craving comes for alcohol or, or prescription drugs. Well, the withdrawal from opiates or benzos, why it can be very uncomfortable, withdrawal from alcohol can be fatal. And for a family member or a person just to act emotionally and just to pour out all the booze just to stop the person could really be the worst thing that they could possibly do. Okay, so a much more sophisticated approach than mm -hmm. reacting with your emotions and anger in a situation yeah. like that. Yeah. What about if, if you're the person yourself and you kind of you know that you've got some issue, how can a person themselves take some steps or what steps might those be to mm -hmm. arrest it or at least get a handle on the issue of addiction? Well, a good place to start would be if the person uh, themselves feel they have a problem would be to talk with a with a caring person in their in their network. Now, when we talk about family, family, mm -hmm. blood relatives may be not the best person for them to talk to, because they may feel judged, they may feel uh, guilt and shame about admitting to a family member. But maybe help the person to identify who's a person that really cares about me. You know, that could be a neighbor. That could be. Uh, someone in, in their women's club, just who is a person that really cares and talk to that person and I think the next thing you want to do is um, talk to some professional, you know. You know, as far as reaching out to a friend or a neighbor, what would be some, uh, a, some language that I could use? You know, it, mm -hmm. it's uncomfortable perhaps mm -hmm. for a friend, or I may believe that it's uncomfortable for a friend to mm -hmm. help me. Mm -hmm. How would I broach that, that subject with them? What would I mm -hmm. say? Well, you could always act as if the old hypothetical person. Okay. I have a friend who's having this problem. And see, what it is, Greg, um, alcoholism and addiction among uh, the elderly now is so pervasive is that there's not many family members or not many people that don't have close friends or, or that have had a family member themselves that has been touched. Mm -hmm. um, by alcoholism or prescription drug use or illicit drug use. So it's not as hard as it once was to really uh, come in contact with someone that's in a, a social network that knows someone mm -hmm. uh, and sort of like a hockey assist, right. you know, to uh, be able to talk to someone. But uh, per certainly um, the way that most alcoholics would do it anyway, they would act as if we call it you know mm -hmm. it says well I have a friend who would you suggest that they talk to and and get some names that way but certainly their their own medical doctor okay. would be a person uh, that they could talk to as well mm -hmm. yeah. good so a person who has that, that that bubbling maybe start of a threshold knowledge they can reach out it's not gonna hurt if they do that no it's not gonna hurt at all and one of the signs uh, that a person can can look for in themselves that that they're starting to have a concern uh, they'll have attempts to control themselves what that might look like they may go from drinking uh, highballs or drinking liquor switching to wine or switching from wine to beer something that in their mind tells them it's less um, it's, it's, it's not as strong or mm -hmm. not as direct. Mm -hmm. And those attempts to do that are clear signs of control or attempts to control. And the fact of it is, Greg, when people make an attempt to control something, the facts are it's probably starting to get 
very okay. much out of control. Okay, so we can look for those signs in ourselves. Mm -hmm. You know, is it harder to diagnose uh, uh, addiction as a person ages? You know, is it harder f with a 60-year-old and a 70-year-old for you as a, a professional in it to detect that? Yes, it is. And, and some of the reasons because that, because so many of the signs and symptoms of alcoholism and addiction um, mimic or mask by other physical ailments that people tend to have. As people age, they tend to have more medical conditions. Mm -hmm. So what we would look for as a sign in a 30-year-old would could clearly look like a sign of addiction. Uh, in an elderly person, it could probably look like a sign of, of hypertension or a sign of, uh, of uh, cognitive um, decline. Or, and actually, mm -hmm. it's due to physiological changes in the body that mask um, alcoholism addiction so it really is important to raise awareness uh, in family members and treating professionals of what to look for are, are the regular treating physicians your family physicians are they um, are they up to speed with looking at addiction in an older adult or is there is there an issue there in the medical community there's an there is an issue there now Medical doctors, they're, they're keenly aware of drug interactions and, and medications and what they do, but the amount of training that they actually get in medical school for substance abuse amounts to a three-credit course. Mm -hmm. um, Dr. Robert Krantz, who's our medical director at Hanley Center and myself, we, um, we lecture at the University of Miami um, mm -hmm. uh, medical students. We lecture every term raising awareness about substance dependency. They just, you know, it's a self-report from the patient. They ask the patient, well, how many drinks are you having? Well, the patient may say, well, two a day. And really, it's two uh -huh. uh, a day. And a lot of times, when it comes to the prescription medications, uh, the doctors in and of themselves are prescribing the medications. And um, for many of us, we have a relationship with our doctor if we call and we describe some symptoms. and he'll call in, you know, some antibiotics or, or mm -hmm. something for us. And so when you take into account older adults and the problems that they're, they're having and the relationships they've had with their treating professionals for years, uh, they in a, an annoying way become part of the problem. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, that, uh, that's not a pleasant thought, but we're gonna, we're gonna try to give even some more suggestions for people to help mm -hmm. and show your website as well as some other sources for people in this short break and we'll be right back. Stay with us. Okay. Whether you're suffering yourself or whether you're part of a family suffering with the family issue of addiction, we have our expert, Juan Harris, from the Hanley Center in Florida, and thank you so much for being with us. Can people unintentionally become an addict? Oh, absolutely, Greg. How, how so? Yeah, and actually that's a, a term I've coined, accidental addicts, and what I mean by that is, especially when we're talking about elders, mm -hmm. um, they are prescribed, the average on average, 17 prescriptions a year by 4.5 doctors. And this is a group that, uh, of those prescriptions, the ones that are prescribed the most are the benzodiazepines. This is a group that includes Xanax and Valium and Transine and, and uh, Ativan, Ambien, that group. Mm -hmm. um, Psychiatrically is indicated for general anxiety disorder, but older adults will typically get them from their PCPs, the primary care physicians, for uh, sleep mm -hmm. complaints. Mm -hmm. Well, this group of benzodiazepines, um, with repeated use, uh, and you combine the physiological changes that happens in an elder's body, 
Uh, for example, as a person ages, the water content decreases. Um, the albumin in the blood, which is the active ingredient that medications uh, attach to, that right. decreases. So we're in uh, liver functions decrease, um, kidney functions decrease. And so we're in a dose of medication can be therapeutic in a younger individual. It can become toxic in older adults. And so that pattern with those changes and the pattern of tra taking these benzodiazepines, a person be can become addicted to the medication. And of course, they'll take it as prescribed because this is a group that espouses all of the values that are so important in this country. They're honest, mm -hmm. they're hardworking, they have integrity, they're responsible, and the number one thing about them, they respect authority. Mm -hmm. And so the reason that we say accidental addicts because in their minds they can't really be an addict because they associate the word addict with that younger criminalized group. Right. And they are not an addict because the doctor Dr. gave Sorkin. it to them. So certainly, unconsciously, accidentally, um, they won't have the behaviors in terms of uh, mm -hmm. uh, of addiction, you know, in terms right. of going out doctor shopping and doing that. But the physical addiction is building because as prescribed goes from 30 pills a month to 60 pills a month to 180 and it gets to a point where it just takes over their lives and that's when they usually end up um, in oh treatment my. centers. Well, I can understand at the front end of that, hopefully, mm -hmm. uh, better communications with your doctor or doctors. Mm -hmm. But once we skip past that front end and mm -hmm. a person finds themselves to be an accidental um, addict or is worried about it, mm -hmm. what are a couple of steps that they might be able to take? Well, the, they're going to need to be medically detoxed. So they'll need treatment. You know, the person really can't uh, stop on their own. So for them to attempt to stop on their own could be very, very disastrous. They'd be at risk for seizure or, or falls or different things if they tried to uh, detox mm -hmm. themselves. And so the best thing to do would be to uh, speak with a, a professional, get into a treatment program, probably since they haven't uh, been in treatment before and depending on how, how far it's gone, they probably can do um, um, a medical, a residential medical detoxification program. It may be appropriate for a day program or an intensive outpatient program. Now, depending on how severe it's mm -hmm. gotten them, if, if it's affecting their memory, mm -hmm. then it may be very, very important for them to be in a residential program which provides a, a, a safe environment, a structured environment. Well, I can just see from how you're describing it how, yes. how aging or our maybe beliefs about aging with mm -hmm. memory can mask uh, a much more serious problem that could be correctable. Oh, absolutely, yeah. absolutely. Um, older adults are quickly given a diagnosis of dementia or early Alzheimer's where the big difference between dementia and Alzheimer's, a uh, simple difference is Alzheimer's is fatal. Mm -hmm. uh, dementia would be, I forget where right. I put my keys. Mm -hmm. You know, with Alzheimer's, I, I actually forget what keys are for. Mm -hmm. You know, it's a huge difference. But this is misdiagnosed in older adults with substance dependency, uh, and especially prescription drug dependency, mm -hmm. as uh, suffering from um, signs of early dementia or, or, or Alzheimer's. It really is a misdiagnosis. Mm -hmm. Huge problem. And now, in the case of addiction, where a person does become um, addicted and this growing problem among uh, boomer adults and older adults, mm -hmm. What effect does it have the same, or what effect does it have on their brain? You've got some dramatic slides. Yeah. What do these different substances do? Well, well, alcohol and drugs release a chemical in the brain called dopamine that seeks to the mesocortolimbic pathway. That's the reward pathway in the midbrain. Now, there's other behaviors that release that same shopping, gambling, Mm -hmm. um, working out, food, water, sex, they all release that same chemical. But alcohol and drugs release this chemical to this reward pathway in a way that's much more salient than those other behaviors or things. Those others are what we call process addictions. And the brain remembers those. Mm -hmm. And the brain says, ooh, I'll, it's, it's almost like the brain remembering a shot of dopamine it gets from eating chocolate cheesecake as a as compared to the shot of dopamine it might get from an all-you-can-eat liver buffet 
Yeah. Okay. You know, it's, you know, if you're hungry, it'll, it'll work for you. But it remembers that from the drugs and alcohol. And that with repeated, repeated, repeated use, this reward pathway becomes conditioned to where the use uh, of the drugs and alcohol is no more reward. I like to use an economics term to describe it, and I call it the law of diminishing returns. You know, what that is, and this, this happens in the brain, if I'm really, really hungry, Greg, mm -hmm. and, I, and I buy three cheeseburgers, right. well, I get a lot of satisfaction when I eat that first cheeseburger, but I get less satisfaction when I eat the second cheeseburger and even less satisfaction when I eat the third. When we're talking about the amount of, of um, dopamine shots that go to that brain, we're talking 10,000 cheeseburgers. Well, once that conditional response happens in the brain, that's permanent. Mm -hmm. And we use a medical de term to describe what, what has happened, and it's called the law, uh, it's called uh, cross dependency. And this is what's important. Once cross dependency happens, just by the fact that a person's brain chemistry has crossed over, has become saturated for their drug of choice, whether that be benzos, whether that be alcohol, whether that be cocaine, heroin, whatever, they are then addicted to every other addictive mood-altering drug, whether they have tried those drugs or not. So what happens in the brain, a person can come into treatment for prescription drug use, but say, oh, alcohol never caused me a problem, you know, so I can drink alcohol, big mistake. Big and, it, and it literally, the slides that we're showing, it literally decreases uh, the, the, functioning. the functioning of the brain. Yeah, it kills yeah. brain cells. We, we use um, an assessment, we use a spec scan. Um, and I think that these, these pictures actually show that, that our viewers are seeing right now, mm -hmm. but, uh, okay. and dramatically so. Mm -hmm. um, I want to talk about family problems, compounding okay. addiction. and. Mm -hmm. And how, how do families complicate and compound a person's problem? Well, it's important to understand that in treating an addiction, the whole family has to be treated. It's a family systems problem. And when, when treating the addicted individual and you don't treat the family network, well, that's, that's a huge problem because a person comes into treatment, they learn skills necessary to leave treatment to remain sober, but if they're entering back into a, a still untreated family system, it's very hard for that person to maintain their own sobriety. And so, I can imagine the anger that a family builds up and all the emotional reaction they have, mm -hmm. that does become uh, just a real hornet's nest of issues to deal with. Oh, absolutely. And it's important that the family members are participate in a, some type of family program and get their own family because family um, systems, I mean, they're, they're you have closed family networks and open family networks, and a lot of times for alcoholics or addicts, they grew up in a family that, that they, they don't feel, they don't trust, they don't talk, they don't share, they don't see. And, um, and this type of family dynamic, you can tell when a person comes into treatment because uh, some of the treatment dynamics really point out. You can predict what type of family system mm -hmm. uh, they came from, and that's an unhealthy family network. But by getting the family and treating the entire family and getting the family into treatment, uh, then that family becomes healthy. And if the uh, addicted individual uh, tries to enter into this family network that's healthy, it'll be easier for them to get mm -hmm. this person back into treatment because this person uh, can't enter into that family system and affect that whole system, which is the way it was prior to treatment. So. The family unit is very, very important in treating everyone because it is a family illness. You know, I love uh, old movies, and uh, when you look back at old movies, you mm -hmm. see real caricatures of the drunk, the town yeah. drunk yeah. and under the bridge. Yeah. And our, old, our older generation, even the boomer generation, he has yeah. these movie Hollywood visions of that. Does that complicate things as well or yeah. add to the denial? That's a stereotypical image that that people think, well, what's an alcoholic where it's the guy that's drinking out a paper bag or the guy that's sleeping under the bridge? Not so. I know in New York City, you see on the trains a lot, you see these posters of all these Wall Street guys in suits and all says, who's in this picture is an alcoholic? And, but that's the picture. Uh, it's a huge myth that alcohol and drug use is a larger problem among, among minorities. Not so. 
Uh, it is mainstream. Um, some of the problems and barriers in identifying it is that it's such, it's socially acceptable. Uh, and a lot of times it's not illegal so people don't commit crimes to get alcohol. And the first real intervention may come from a medical provider when the doctor uh, says for some medical, see some medical connection and says, you know, I'm really concerned about your, your lab work as it relates to your, your liver enzymes or your, your ammonia levels. And, um, you know, I think you need to cut back on your drinking. Boy, yeah. we only have one minute left, and I've got so many questions. And, and there's Aunt Tilly in the family who always has her three wines, and then everybody excuses that. Mm -hmm. Do you see that as almost a family maybe accepts that behavior yeah. problem? Well, yes, and that's, that's a family's view that's a, a ageism view where it's almost like saying, well, that's the last pleasure that Aunt Tilly has, and it's okay if she... Uh, we don't want to take away her last pleasure. Another way of saying that, it's okay if Aunt Tilly drinks herself to death. And uh, that's such a huge problem uh, from family members, the people closest. But it's not about how much um, time a person left, it's about the quality of time left. Mm -hmm. I can't tell you how many letters I've gotten over the years where uh, family members have written to me thanking me for and thanking the Hanley Center for the last three, four, five years of mm -hmm. their loved one's life and they died soberly. And that was the legacy that well, they left for the grandkids. That's a great point. And yeah. let's close it out with this as far mm -hmm. as uh, in, in your reading and talking with you. Um, addiction programs, uh, do they work better or equal with older adults? Older adults do better in programs among their peers their own age. They just do not respond to programs where they're placed in treatment with, with 20 years. The issues are just so much different. So in seeking a treatment program, look for a same age A same age, group. age specific, you know, and mm -hmm. uh, at, at Hanley Center, I direct the, an older adult program and then my older adults start getting younger and younger is why mm -hmm. I uh, started a boomer program three years ago. Well, thank you for all your work. You're very you, welcome, you Greg. You do terrific work, and yeah. this, is a, this is an important issue that people need to get a handle on. And Juan Harris, you are a great resource, so thank you for all your work and being with Graceful Aging. Thank you, Greg, and thanks for having me. My pleasure. Yeah. So if you've got some difficulties, there is help available for you. Look to yourself, look to your family, family members. It's one big family still, and get your family in order, and let's live life as best as possible. That's all for today on Graceful Aging. We'll see you next time.